Colossians 1, and uh, just again, we are going to be reading from the ESV. And we're going to be reading from verse 19. The Word of God reads, For in him, Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to open up your Bibles Uh, to follow along Colossians chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 so many of the lines from those songs are found in the text that we have that's how it should be just singing to God for the past 10 or so years, you could say, uh, all the rage has been on television house renovation shows. Those reality shows that are so popular, shows like The Block, House Rules, all of those things. What exactly is the appeal about them? Now, it's not just to see the finished product uh, of the house, a new beautiful house. You can go see a new beautiful house anywhere. The appeal is seeing the house before, what it was, seeing the transformation and then getting to the finished product. And that is what wows the audience. Back in May, at the end of May, Brooke and I had flown down here to Gouin and we were just uh, visiting. And we were warmly greeted at the doors. When we walked in, we, we sat down and we looked around at this new building and we just thought, wow, what a wonderful job has been done here. What a place where God's people can gather. And and we were talking about it. So what a wonderful facility. But it wasn't till I had the opportunity of coming here and starting to speak to people about those who were involved in the process and how long the process took and how much work was done. And it wasn't till last week till the slideshow seeing the before and after photos, just to see how much has actually happened. And then a whole new appreciation for this place took hold of us. And, and that was where the magnificence was, seeing the before and after. This morning, the Holy Spirit wants to show you something stunning. He wants to show you something incredible, a photograph of you, how God sees you, what you look like, to him in his sight but in order for you to grasp just how magnificent how wondrous how incredible it is the holy spirit wants to show you the before shot now the temptation is going to be for every person in this room to look away to not want to see it because it's unpleasant but in order to appreciate what he has done and the new that has been brought about, he bids us to look back at an old photograph so that you can appreciate and I can appreciate the new. And so with what is difficult, let's come before the Lord and pray quickly and ask him for his blessing to help us to receive what he has to say. Father, we come to you now and we thank you for what we have been able to see. It has been such a blessing to magnify the name of Jesus Christ, to rejoice over what he has done. And we pray that you have been glorified so far. And now as we open your word, we open up a book, a book that isn't 
a bunch of writings of opinion. It is a book of the truth. It's a living book that gives life. And we pray that we would hear. Help us to see what you would have us to see this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be moving amongst us in a powerful way. Lord, give us, give us clear vision this morning. And Lord, may we behold wondrous things that you have done. Lord, we pray that you may break down any pride, any walls that we might set up so that we can receive the truth of God. And so, Lord, we ask this because we are incapable of bringing about change, but you are altogether able. And so we call upon your name this morning. And Lord, magnify your Son. In our midst we ask this. Amen. Well, if you remember what we have just seen, Paul has painted for us in the previous verses the portrait of Christ's majesty. And he's taken us far back and he's taken us far above. We went far back before eternity began, before time began, and we saw the Son of God as the image of the invisible God who created this entire universe. He created time. And he took us far above the heavens and the universe because we saw the Son of God as the one who sustains this earth and has authority over physical and spiritual beings, angels and people alike. And so he has taken us so far back and so high and now he wants us to strap our seatbelts in because we are coming down fast and we are going down, 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 down to a little town called Bethlehem. Look where he takes us, straight to the incarnation. Look at verse 19. For in him, that is Christ, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell pleased to dwell in Christ. See, Christ is not a manifestation of God. He's not merely a representative or a messenger of God. He is the Son of God in all the perfections, all the divine attributes, all the power of God was dwelling in Christ bodily. It was seen in Christ. Now again, Paul's saying this. Remember the context. The false teachers are coming in and they're reducing Christ They're offering a greater spiritual experience outside of Christ, a more fuller experience of the spiritual life. And Paul says, fuller, all the fullness of God is in Christ. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to look. And so we ask, why has God taken on flesh? the one above the heavens and the universe, why is he now in bodily form upon this little tiny planet that he oversees? Well, verse 20. And through Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, God has sent Christ to come and reconcile all things to himself. That term reconcile, we know it. The simple dictionary meaning to restore to friendship and to make peace. So we are told that there is a war going on, that there is a war in this world. There are warring parties with hostility being expressed. There are groups that are out of harmony and at odds with God. And God has come through Jesus Christ to reconcile all things to himself. And so this leads to our first point this morning. If you are taking notes, we see the object of reconciliation. The object of reconciliation. Now Paul tells us there are two groups God came to reconcile to himself. Two different groups that he came to reconcile. The first one is surprising. The first group is creation. Creation. Look at verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Now, remember way back when we were studying Psalm 19. Now, the NIV, uh, sorry, the ESV misses it a little bit here. The word where it says heaven, that is supposed to be in the plural in the Greek, heavens. And when the scriptures say heavens, what's it referring to? The universe, the sky, the expanse, the galaxies and the planets. This is in the plural here. And then he says, so 
all things in the heavens and things that are on earth. So our planet, the seas, the land, all that is in it. So we've got the universe and the earth. And God sent Christ to reconcile to himself the universe and our planet earth. Now, what on earth is going on here? Reconcile creation. Well, when you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, it says God made everything good and each day it repeats it. And it was good. And it was good. And what's God trying to say? Everything is in harmony with God. Everything is as it ought to be. Everything pleases Him. And then you move to Genesis chapter 3. And everything that was very good became very bad. Very quickly too. Sin fractures creation. It mars the creation that God had made. It poisons it. So when you read Genesis 3.17, God says to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. Because of your sin. And now thorns will come up in the ground that was once paradise. Creation was affected. Romans 8.20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility. Futility. I had the privilege of speaking with Malcolm and Jeanette this past week and they were sharing some of the stories, the difficulties that come with plant farming, weeds and thorns, bacteria and fungi that can even be damaging to our health. Sin affected creation and we see this further on. We are reading the news, we are seeing what's happening in our state. There are floods. The land cannot take more water. The rivers are overflowing. And then we read of other lands. The ground is so dry in drought. And we read of earthquakes. And we read overseas of hurricanes. And all of these things. And it's not just the elements. It's not just the plants that have been affected by sin. We see the animal kingdom. Now, when you go and visit the zoo, you see beautiful incredible creatures that God had made. And as you look at them, you are in wonder. You see God's creativity. We worship the greatest artist. And you look at that. But when you look at these beautiful creatures, what is it between you and them? You see fences. You see cages. And you see glass windows. Because there are creatures in there from the greatest to the smallest, from spiders to snakes to crocodiles to hippos to sharks that could kill the strongest of us in a moment. Friends, it wasn't always that way. In Eden, there were no fences. There were no cages. And there were no glass windows. But sin affected everything. All of creation. And I was reminded of this just a week ago. We've got at home two pets, a dog and a cat, and both are very good with kids. But I was told walking into the kitchen that our cat had left a present for us at the back door. Our cat's known to kill things and I I went out to the back door and there was this big rabbit that it had killed. And as I looked at it to clean it up, again I was taken back because as I looked at the carcass, there was nothing eaten. Something in the cat decided that it was just instinct to kill this other creature. Just an instinct within. Not for hunger. Not for survival. Instinct. Creation has been greatly affected by sin. And this earth that we live on, this planet, has been the stage for some of the greatest atrocities. We just read back through history. And think about all the demonic activity that goes on on this planet from witchcraft to mediums to sorcery to black magic to the occult. How much demonic activity and how much blood has this earth drunk over the centuries from the blood of innocent Abel that cried out to God from the soil to the millions of corpses to the Holocaust. That's why... In Romans 8.22 it says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. 
So when you see the dry lands that are parched, screaming for water, and you see other lands that are overflowing because it cannot take any more, and when hurricanes come, and when you watch on TV one animal hunting another through the savannah, what are you witnessing? You are witnessing all creation groaning like a pregnant woman in labor because of sin. Because of sin, a creation that is out of harmony with God and His design. And Paul says, God sent Christ to reconcile the universe and the earth to Himself. See, Christ comes. And he takes on sin and he defeats sin and he ushers in the new creation. He deals with the sin problem. There is a Christmas carol that we sing. I hope we're going to sing it at the end of the year. You know joy to the world. But the lyrics, what is it saying? That line, No more let sins and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings grow far as the curse is found. That's what He came to do. Christ came to reconcile, to reverse the curse that was on this planet. That's why when He was hanging on the cross, what was He wearing? A crown of thorns. And God was preaching to us from the cross that He was bringing everything back into harmony with Himself and dealing with sin. And He will bring in the new heavens and the earth and everything will be renewed because of what happened on Calvary. Paul says there are two groups that Christ came to reconcile. The first is all of creation and the second is humanity. Now I said at the beginning, Paul has an old photograph that he wants to show us. He's shown us the majesty of Christ and now he has a whole photo, an old photo of us. And we need grace to receive it. Look at verse 21 as we look back. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Compare that to the portrait that he had just given of Christ. Now look at the photograph of us. The previous photograph of Christ, it leads to wonder. It leads to awe. It leads to worship. And then we see the old photo of us and it makes us want to hide our faces. The difference. And he says, and you who once were. This is a photo of before we came to Christ. Before we were saved. Before we were given a new heart. Before we were born again. Before we received eternal life. And this is a picture of every unsaved person. Every unsaved person. Now, what do we see in this photo? We see three defining qualities about us. The first one, he says, you were alienated. You were alienated from God. Alienated here means to be cut off, apart, distanced, separate from. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? Immediately, they were kicked out of the garden, separate from the presence of God. What do we see in the story of the prodigal son? He is in a far and distant land. He is far away from the Father. It is a picture of sinners. And alienation from God, it is especially true of Gentiles, of non-Jews, which is probably most of us, if not all of us here. What did Paul say to the Ephesians? Ephesians 2.11 Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What's Paul saying? You, you didn't have the Scriptures You didn't have the prophets. You didn't have the temple. You didn't have the sacrifices. You had none of the promises. You were nowhere near God. Nowhere near Him. You were so far off. You were alienated from God. And friends, this is every one of us. And perhaps it still might be some in this room this morning. Separate from God. Secondly, the thing that the photo shows, we see here in verse 21, And you were once hostile in mind. Now that is very, very strong language. 
very strong language. You may remember two weeks ago when you were in the text, I shared that story in the beginning of the year when a friend of mine and I from our church, we went to visit that family who were being tormented by demons in their home, evil spirits, and shared that event and the stories that they told. And when we spoke to them, we answered them and we gave them the gospel. And we urged them, we urged them, you need to be reconciled to God. You need God for you and with you and Christ for you. And we urged them and we offered them the remedy. We offered them the only hope and they had no interest. When they found out, when they realized that we had no magic prayer for them, that we had no incantation or no incense to burn to immediately fix the problem, they thanked us and bid us farewell. And we left. Do you see what's happening here? He was a family that was terrorized by evil spirits. The children were terrified. The mother was shaken and frightened. And the husband, he was at his wit's hand. They were frightened. They were desperate, but they did not want a Savior and Lord. They did not want Jesus Christ. They wanted what Jesus could offer to bring peace to their situation, but they did not want Jesus himself. And we witnessed the hostility of mine firsthand. They preferred torment to following Jesus Christ with their life. I remember when I first got saved and something that a preacher said, and it stuck with me now for 12 years. And he said, everyone wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. Hostile in mind. Hostile in mind. See, when we tend to think hostile in mind towards God, people who are hostile to God, we, we might tend to think of progressives who are trying to rewrite marriage to include homosexuality. Or we might think of those who are trying to mutilate the children through trans- transgenderism. Or those who are trying to infiltrate into Christian schools to change their policies and creep in and even corrupt the truth there. We may be thinking of those who celebrate and raise a toast to legalizing abortion. When we think of those who are hostile in mind, we might think of false teachers who fill the pulpits and pretend to be pastors every Sunday. We might think of others who are religious extremists and we read of them persecuting Christians all around the world. And the answer to that is yes, 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 yes. It refers to all of them, but it's not limited to them. Not only to those who are outwardly extreme, but hostile in mind refers to anyone who puts off Jesus Christ. Anyone who puts him off. It is those who say to you, when you speak to them of Jesus, thanks so much. But no thanks, I'm not interested. A rejection of Jesus Christ. And what are they doing? They are washing their hands like Pontius Pilate who thought he was innocent but didn't realize that he was just as guilty as the mob who screamed out, crucify him. Because he rejected Christ. Hostile in mind. You see, you can come to church And you can sit in the pews and you can sing the songs and you can go through the service and you can still be hostile to God. Hostile in mind, that is war language. That's why it says, God sent Christ to reconcile us. To bring peace. To end the war. See, this makes, and this has massive implications for how we do evangelism. How we evangelize. And I believe much of the modern church is guilty of concealing from people what they need. Concealing the truth of what they need. You know, it's almost painful sometimes. Jesus is portrayed so often as this lonely deity who's just longing for another friendship. What, what, What is often said to unbelievers? I need a relationship with Jesus. Where do you find that in the Bible? Would it be fitting to say of Ukraine and Russia, they need a relationship? 
No, they have a relationship. It's a hostile one. Unbelievers, they have a relationship with God and it's a hostile one. And they need to know that they need a positive relationship with God. One of peace, one of reconciliation and forgiveness. Peace between enemies. How did Paul evangelize? How did Paul speak to unbelievers? How did he speak of their situation? 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and verse 20, he says this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. We are ambassadors for Christ. God, making His appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see the difference? Sinners need peace with God. It's a hard photograph to look at, isn't it? It's uncomfortable. And yet the Holy Spirit says to us now, don't look away just yet. There's a little bit more. Don't look away just yet. See, the hostile mind, it's an attitude, it's a mindset. And when this is the mindset of a person, it must find its avenue in action. And so what does he say next? Look at the third thing that we see. Verse 21. You were hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. See, a hostile mind is never neutral. It finds expression. And the result is doing evil deeds. Now, when you turn on the news and you watch the news, we see violence, we see shootings, we see abuse, we see sexual perversion, we see great injustices, we see incredibly wicked things, and yet we continue to hear reporters say this was an inhumane act, an inhumane crime. And my question is, how many times does humanity have to commit the same crimes over and over again before we stop calling it inhumane acts? When will we acknowledge with pain in our hearts This is consistent with our nature. It's consistent with who we are. I remember when my oldest son was young and we'd be driving at night and there'd be a full moon in the sky. I'd say, Hosey, look, look at the full moon. And he'd go, wow, wow. And we'd talk about it. And then the next time we'd drive and there was a full moon, I'd say it again, wow. Later on down the track, when I would point it out, the reaction wouldn't be the same. Because a child learns very quickly that a full moon is not a phenomenon. Adults, the human world seems to fail to realize that evil deeds are not a phenomenon. They're not. It is consistent with our nature. And you know, Jesus, he took the same photograph as Paul does here of humanity. And he says, Humanity doesn't fail to see that evil deeds are not a phenomenon. They hide the truth that they know. What did Jesus say in John chapter 3, verse 19? For men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and here it is, they do not come to the light lest their deeds are exposed. You see, there's a reason why when you talk to unsaved family or unsaved colleagues about Jesus, there's a reason why you get that response. I don't want to talk about that Jesus stuff anymore. There's a reason or many reasons why they won't come to church. And one of those reasons is because they do not want their evil deeds to be exposed by the Word of God. They don't want light to be shone upon their evil deeds and thus they prove that they're hostile in mind. And thus they prove that they are alienated from God and that the Scriptures be true in every man a lie. You may remember that famous event in history in 1961 when the District Court of Jerusalem put on trial Adolf Eichmann. It was one of the first global media events. Adolf Eichmann was an SS Nazi officer, he was tried on 15 separate accounts. Crimes against the Jewish people, crimes against humanity, war crimes. 
and the list went on. Now, his role, Adolf Eichmann, he carried out the dispatch of trains, carrying a thousand people on each train to Auschwitz and to other extermination camps. He was overseeing what they called the final solution, which, let me quote, was to obliterate an entire people from the face of the earth. So he coordinated a thousand people on each train to be sent to be killed. Now he was tried, he was, and he was tried as one who had committed a thousand acts of premeditated murder with every train. It's incredible. Now the trial was televised for the world to see, and the world was shocked for these things to be surfaced, these crimes that were happening in the Nazi regime, and the world was horrified. And yet during that trial, something happened in a corner of the courtroom that didn't make a scene. Let me read of it. There was a Jewish man who stepped in and watched a part of Eichmann's trial and he burst into tears. Someone next to him said, your anger must be unbearable. The sobbing Jewish man replied, no, it isn't anger. The longer I sit here, the more I realize I have a heart like his. How could a Jewish man identify with this mass murderer? This Jewish man had probably never, ever shed anyone's blood in his life. And yet he knew, he knew what corruption was. He knew from experience what it was to be selfish and loveless. He knew what it was to be greedy and evil. He knew what it was to lie and to be deceitful. He knew what it was to commit perversion. And he identified with that man different deeds, same heart. And so I ask you, have you identified with the old photograph that Paul gives to us here? Do you see? Can you identify and say, yes, it's all true. It's all true. And have you seen that your sins are too many? Far too many for you to atone for. And you have to come before God and say, God, you have to deal with it because they outweigh the sand on the seashore. It's too much. So the question follows, if we are alienated from God because of our sins, and if we are controlled by a hostile mind, and if we are guilty having committed innumerable evil deeds, then how can we be reconciled to God? How is that possible? Well, two things must happen. We need the penalty for our sins dealt with. And we also need the power of sin over our lives dealt with. And this leads to the second point this morning. And we'll be quick with these last. The second point this morning is the means of reconciliation. The means of reconciliation. Look what God has done, verses 19 and 20. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Peace through the blood of his cross. That is a long form of trying to say he died the horrific death of crucifixion. The blood of his cross. And you see what Paul has done in the previous verses. He took us above the heavens. He took us into the Godhead. We saw the Son of God. We saw him creating the universe, sustaining the universe, being in control all, of all things. And now he comes down and he brings us down to Calvary. And the Son of God has nails driven through his wrists upon a Roman cross. There's that song that we sing come see his hands and his feet the scars that speak of sacrifice hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered the blood of his cross splattered upon the wood trickling down the beam more blood into the earth but this blood now points us back to the Old Testament sacrificial system in the Old Testament, God required the blood of animals, the death of animals, as a covering for sin. They were sin offerings. It's where we get the word atonement from. To make amends for what is wrong. And that's what the animals were there for, to make amends. 
And then comes the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. And He sacrifices His life for us as a sin offering unto God, by God, and the blood of His cross. That's Him saying that His life was pouring out for us until He breathed His last breath. He poured out His life for us. What was the cost of peace with God? It was the blood of His cross. Sinners reconciled to God and God reconciled to sinners. Because we see in the Scriptures that God is angry with sinners. What what does it say in Nahum 1-2? The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on His foes and reserves His wrath for His enemies. Who are His enemies? We've just read it. Who is hostile towards God? And God is storing up wrath for humanity. But what does God do? Instead of pouring out His wrath upon us, He pours it upon His own Son. And His Son dies in our place under the wrath of God. Romans 5.9 says this, Since we've been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved by Him from His wrath? The blood. So in our verse says we have peace with God through His blood. Paul re-emphasizes it. Look at verse 22. He is now reconciled in His body of flesh By his death. It came through his body of flesh dying for us. See, the blood of animals, the blood of animals was never designed to be the solution. The killing of the animals, it was it was to show us what our sin deserved, and it was to prepare us for the sacrifice that God would provide. That's what the system was there for. Romans eight three says God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin. Thus, he condemned sin in the flesh. Man had sinned against God and man had fell. And it was the Son of God. And there you have it, sin dealt with in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a little detail in these verses that I almost missed. And I praise God that he showed it to me. Because if you miss the detail, you miss the very heart of God in all of this. Look at verses 19 and 20 again. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself to himself all things. Did you spot it? It pleased God. It pleased God to fully dwell in his incarnating son. You see, the incarnation is pleasing to God. The plan of saving sinners delighted God. The plan to come and rescue us delighted and pleased God to not give us what we deserve and for Him to bear the cost Himself. It pleased God. What a precious invitation we have from the Father this morning. What a precious invitation. It pleases Him to save sinners, to rescue them. Christ came because God so loved the world. That's why He came. And it's such love that can take people who are alienated from God and draw them in irresistibly. It's such mighty love that can take a frozen heart that is hostile to Him and melt it into loving affection for the Savior. It's mighty love. It's mighty love. This leads to our third point this morning. And very quickly the finished product of reconciliation. The finished product. Before, we have seen the before photograph and it was tough. But the Holy Spirit has done that so we can see how incredible the new photograph is. You ready to see it? The new you. Look at verse 22. The end of verse 22 says, He is now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. Can you imagine a convicted criminal who is deserving and waiting for a life sentence? A life sentence. And the judge stands there and says, I now find you upright, innocent, and free of all charges. 
What are you going to say to that criminal? It's time to wake up from your dream now. It's time to wake up. It's not real. That doesn't happen. That can't happen. Look what Christ is able to do for sinners. He is able to take the wicked and make them holy. He is able to take the defiled and make them radiant. The unholy, holy, and those who are condemned free of all accusation. Christ and Christ alone is able to do that. Christian, that is you before God. Holy and blameless in His sight above every accusation from people and the devil himself. That's how you will be presented on the final day. And to anyone here who doesn't know Christ, this can be you. He just calls you to repent of your sin, to put down the weapons of your war, and to believe in His Son. And you'll have peace with Him. But see, what we have become, it is so ugly, incomprehensible. Look how the Bible describes Jesus Christ. Let me read to you. Hebrews 7, 26. Look at the description of Jesus. It says this, We have such a high priest who truly meets our needs, he who is holy, blameless, undefiled, set apart from sinners. Now what does it say of us? He will present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. How unfathomable is the new photograph? My lips tremble to say it. God sees you as He sees His own Son. When He looks at you, you look to Him as Christ. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Look what you were. Look what I was. And look what we've become. Conformed to the image of Christ. And we will be fully conformed on that final day. We will never be more righteous in God's sight in heaven than we are right now. Than we are right now. What then is Christian growth? What spiritual growth then? If we're righteous in His sight. Well, one pastor said this, I remember. He said, it's becoming in practice what we are in reality before God. It's growing into what we've become. To live righteously as we are righteous before Him to begin. See, there is a push today in the Christianity of today, a push to change the old photo, to edit it, to put a bit of makeup over it, to Photoshop it because it's hideous, because it's offensive. But we don't realize we think we're doing good, we think we're doing right, but what we're doing, we're diminishing our appreciation for grace for how amazing grace is. That's why we can sing so many Christian songs without tears streaming down our faces. Because we forget who we were. And lastly, let me make one comment. The final verse here. The last point, the assurance of reconciliation. Now verse 23 could be a whole sermon devoted to itself. I want to make one comment. The assurance of reconciliation. Verse 23, you will be holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now this seems to be a condition, doesn't it? For obtaining the final promise. He says that if indeed you continue in, in the faith, what does he mean here, if you indeed you're continuing in the faith? Well, he spells it out for you. Look at the last bit of verse 23. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. See, the context is the false teachers are trying to lure them away from Christ and all that Christ is and all that Christ has done. And Paul says, if you buy into that lie, if you depart from the gospel, you will not share in the hope of the gospel. If you seek someone else, you will not have Christ. Now, there's much we could look at this passage because it's a tricky one. But here, the exhortation is a fearful warning to love and cherish and hold fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know one of the greatest evidences that you are truly a Christian? Do you want to know what the evidence is? That you continue in the faith. You continue in the faith. 
You, you love the gospel. You believe the gospel and Christ is everything for you. That's one of the greatest evidences. And so this is why we come and we read God's word and we sing God's word and we pray God's word and we hear God's words preached. Why? So that we will not be shifted from the hope of the gospel, that we may be steadfast and immovable. And so this, my closing question is to you this morning, have you been reconciled to God? Do you have peace with God? Have you come personally, intentionally to Jesus Christ and asked Him for forgiveness and believed on His name. I'm not asking you if you've been coming to this church for a week or 30 years. Not if you've been on a ministry roster or if you're serving. No, have you come to Jesus Christ, called upon His name saying, God, save me through Your Son. Forgive me by Your work on the cross. I believe in You and I renounce myself and take Jesus as my portion. Have you done that? Christ is here this morning. And he's willing. He's willing. Can we pray? Father, we thank you again for your word. Where else have we to go? To you alone have the words of eternal life. We praise your name and we pray that your word would sink deep into our hearts. Lord, may every soul, every precious soul in this room know what it is to have peace with God the greatest treasure in the whole world, Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending your Son with great love. Lord Jesus, we thank you for laying down your life. Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us the Scriptures and opening our eyes to see. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have the privilege of singing now to our great Saviour.